My name's Nigel Brunel and I work for a uh, broking shop called OMF. Um, and over the next sort of 20 to 30 minutes, I'm gonna explain to you in, a base, in basic terms, because I think it's important to keep it a little bit at that level, how futures work and what this milk price future actually means for dairy farmers as a hedging tool. Um, so I just want to do a little bit of an audience test. How many people in the audience here have used futures before? Okay. Um, it's, a few, it's a cup, two or three. Um, so how many people used Fonterra's guaranteed milk price when they had it going? Okay, a few as well. All right. Okay, so um, firstly, I'm not a dairy farmer, but I was actually born on a dairy farm, a failed dairy farm, believe it or not. I won't spend too, too, too much on the story, but in 1963, I was born on a dairy farm in Kaikoura, and um, I was the youngest. And when I was born, believe it or not, I was allergic to milk and fat. And we were the only, just about, my mum would say, the only family in New Zealand on a dairy farm that actually had the import skim milk powder basically to keep me alive. And as you can see right now, I'm not allergic to fat anymore, right? Um, I've got a bit, but we actually had to move off that farm for totally different reasons for what you're looking at today. But I certainly do have some empathy about how tough the dairy market is at the moment and what's going on in the international markets. And if we've got some time left at the end of the presentation, I might just spend a couple of minutes just giving you a view of what's going on in this market over the next sort of 6, 12, 18 months. But what I really want to do over the next sort of 20 minutes is just give some very basics um, around the futures market, what we do, and, um, and how you can use this tool to manage price risk and the risks associated with doing that. So you probably have some questions at the end. So um, look, if we can, we'll, we'll, we'll roll through it and, and keep those questions um, at the end. So just to kick it off, Disclaimer, I'll give everyone a five minute test on the end of that. Um, but basically, these days, financial products are regulated. So obviously there's a risk associated with it. So everyone read that? Good, okay. All right, so I'm just gonna cover the basics now um, of exactly what is a futures contract. So in, in simple terms, a futures contract is really a deal between a buyer and a seller to swap a physical commodity, a price, at a later date, right? That's all they, they are. They're, they're traded on exchanges, and as you're aware, you're in the NZX team. The NZX run the futures market here in New Zealand for dairy and a number of other products that are listed, but they're, they're traded on the exchange, right? As opposed to being traded between individual parties. When you were doing the Fonterra GMP, that was a over-the-counter bilateral contract between two parties. In futures markets, they're traded on an exchange. And there's two main functions, I suppose, that a futures market does. One is hedging, which is about managing risk, and the other is speculation, where people are actually taking positions because they want to try and make money out of the market. We're not going to dwell much on what speculators are. They're not evil people, believe it or not. Speculators are really important to a futures market because they bring liquidity to a market and speculators can come in lots of different shapes and sizes for various reasons. All futures markets positions are managed by cash and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that today because that's really important and that's why no futures market has ever collapsed even through the global financial crisis where Lehman Brothers went out the back door, Bear Stearns went out the back door, no futures market went out the back door. It didn't fail and the number one reason why is because futures markets and futures contracts are all managed by cash. And there's a range of different sort of financial futures out there from financial markets such as interest rates and foreign exchange, physical commodities such as oil, dairy, cheese, um, right through to metals, gold, silver and all that sort of things. So there's a range of different futures markets. In fact, some of them have been around for hundreds of years. Uh, they've been trading wheat futures in the US for almost 200 years, right? So it's been around for a long time. So this is what the sort of known fundamentals of futures, and this is what makes futures a useful tool. So here's just some of the basics. 
So the, the, the quantity or what's inside a futures contract is fixed. And in the case of the futures contract that I'm going to talk most about today, which is the milk price future, that has a fixed 6,000 kilos of milk solids. That's the size of that contract, right? There's a tick value or a, a, a minimum price movement, right? So in the case of um, um, uh, milk price futures, let's just call the price today $5. Uh, starting with a handle of five is probably not a bad thing, but let's just call it $5. The minimum it can move is up or down one cent. That's commonly known as the tick value. So five to 501. The other known fundamentals are we know exactly what months we're trading or what contracts we're trading. Most often there's a front contract known as the spot contract, that's just the term. And then the following contracts are known as the forward contracts or the future contracts or the curve. Some people call it a curve. Uh, and in the case of milk futures, which we'll talk about today, they're annualised contracts, they're annual contracts. So obviously this season that's just about to end next season, the year after, there's five years of futures contract. Oops. Uh, they have expiration dates, so there's always a known expiration date in a futures contract. And in the milk price future, uh, the expiry is in September uh, of each year. Right? So that's known as the expiry date. And settlements of futures contracts are either a physical delivery, so if you're trading in the oil market, you don't close out of your oil contract, there'll be 5,000 barrels of oil turn up on your front doorstep if you don't close that contract out. Most futures contracts are settled by cash, so there's a fix or a final date or a price that they settle, and you can also settle a futures contract by closing the position. So just a bit of terminology. So you, in a futures market, you're either gonna be buying or selling. So obviously if you're buying a futures contract, you think the price is gonna go up, or you're closing out a position where you are short. So you're going long when you're in a buying position. Selling futures contracts or going short is effectively what dairy farmers will be doing if they are using the milk price future. They'll be locking in a price, they'll be selling the futures contract, they'll be going short. That's the terminology. P&L, profit and loss. And this is important to understand as well, and we'll spend a little bit of time on this as we go forward, but basically once you enter into a, a, a position in the futures market, um, the price is going to go up and down. And it's pretty easy to work out what your profit and loss is, simple spreadsheet, back at an envelope, you know that it's got a fixed amount of um, size in it, 6,000 kilos, you know the minimum amount that it can move, one cent, times the number of contracts that you have. So it's pretty easy to, to work out what your P&L is. But profit, your profit of your um, futures is gonna go up and down, and obviously that's important. And we'll go a little bit into a couple of slides and what I actually mean by that and how that has, 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 that, how that has an impact. So let's have a look at the specifics. So the NZX milk price futures contract has got five annual contracts. And as mentioned, it's got 6,000 kilos um, per contract. And as I mentioned, annual contract. So the one that everyone's looking at at the moment, or the two contracts that people are looking at at the moment is the September 17 and the September 18. So the September 17 futures contract is this season that's about to come up. And it will be cash settled in September next year against the final uh, final payout that Fonterra give everyone in around September. Now the initial margin, now this is an important thing to know, right? So this gets back to the earlier point about futures markets being run by cash. The initial margin that you have to put down is $1,800 per contract. So let's just have a think about that for a sec. So if we've got, if we've got one contract and we know that it's got 6,000 kilos of milk solids in it, and if we know that the price of milk is $5, the value of that futures contract is $30,000, okay? So the initial margin is $1,800 at the moment. So that's what you have to put up per contract before you undertake a hedge or deal in a futures contract. So, and that can change. If the futures market becomes much more volatile, the exchange may change the initial margin and they can change it immediately. And if they were to put it up to 2,000 because the market became more volatile, 
you have to top that up immediately. So again, I'm gonna stress a few things about cash flow to you over the next few slides and why that's really, really important, right? So that's the initial margin. The variation margin, this is how it's worked out. When you take a position in any futures market, every day it's mark to market. So you've taken a position at a certain price, at the end of that day, that futures market will settle and there'll be a settlement price published by the exchange. They will use that price and mark that against everyone's position. And everyone that's in a losing position has to put in more cash, and that cash is moved over to everyone in a winning position. That's called variation margin, known as a margin call. Anyone seen the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd? Believe it or not, I actually recommend you get that movie out and have a, it explains this quite well, it's quite funny. Um, I don't recommend The Wolf of Wall Street as a movie to watch. Uh, it's not, not based on a true story whatsoever. Um, but that's the variation margin, and we'll talk about variation margin in a few slides and what it means, because this is very important. This is all about cash flow implications. Bear in mind, futures markets um, are, are run by cash. If you get into a margin call, so if you've got a position in the futures market and it moves against you, and your broker rings you up and tells you that you have to put in some more cash, you'll, you, you should probably know that anyway. That shouldn't be a surprise phone call, right? But if that does happen, you have to put that money up within 24 hours. If you don't, you will most likely be cut out of the market. And that gets back to my earlier point on that first, slot, first couple of slides where I said that futures markets are run by cash. That's why they don't fail. So if someone gets in a margin call and they don't pay their margin call, they get cut out of the market. That just happens, right? And we'll explain a little bit about why, why the cash is important. So why use milk price futures? Why would you use them? Okay, so the, no, the number one reason why, and this hasn't been around before other than Fonterra's guaranteed milk price, is to really manage price risk. So from a farmer's perspective, they now have a tool that they can use to lock in a price or a hedge. The other reason why people might use milk price futures is to speculate. We've already got people ringing our firm, looking at the futures market, going, oh, there's milk price futures, that's quite interesting. It's trading at 460 for the September 17 year. I think that's probably a bit cheap. Might go up. It's trading around 560 for the following season. Some people think that's probably not a bad price either. So there's speculators in the market as well. Why else use futures to lock in long-term contracts? Why do you think Fonterra had a guaranteed milk price? Because they wanted the ability to lock in milk for the long term because they've got a large number of customers coming to them all the time making all sorts of stuff from yogurt to you know chocolate to infant powder and those customers would lock, knock on a door like Fonterra and say we want a price for milk powder or skim for the next 12 18 months so by Fonterra being able to use G, that's how they were using GMP. So they could actually lock in a price for milk long term and then make a price to that customer and theoretically make money, which theoretically comes into the dividend for those that are Fonterra farmers. They could make better decisions about the product mix. Not everything goes into whole milk powder. There's skim, there's fat, there's butter, there's cheese, there's all sorts of things. So by them and other processes, it's not just Fonterra, because this trades overseas in other markets, those processes can make better decisions about other products. Right now, cheese is going through the roof in the US. So a processor might go, well, actually, I'll stop making this skim or whole milk powder, and I'll go and make cheese or something else. They can make better decisions. The futures market allows those buyers of that futures contract to make better decisions. And other reasons that people might use it is to arbitrage dairy markets. Now, without getting too technical, there are people out there in the market, call them speculators, call them traders, whatever, but they are 
you know, bright kids sitting in front of computers with spreadsheets and mathematical tools, and they're working out where the price of things should be and taking advantage of that. Arbitrage is actually good for a market. So that's another reason why, why people might use milk price futures. But today, for this audience, we're going to talk to you about using milk price futures if you're a dairy farmer looking to lock in the milk that you sell at the gate. And one final thing, hedging is the opposite of speculating. So I'm here to talk to you about hedging, how to manage risk, not speculation. Okay, you can by all means speculate in the market and there's dozens of markets that we can take you along to if you want to speculate including this. But I want to specifically talk about managing risk, price risk and how you can do that. Okay, so firstly the risks of hedging with futures. Now this is really important. Uh, the number one thing to bear in mind with this market, it's a cash market as we understand. So if you're looking to do one futures contract, you've got to put up your $1,800. Uh, and then if that market moves against you, you've got to put up extra cash to manage that position. So if you are looking to use milk price futures in discussions with us or other people that you might deal with in the market, you also need to be having a discussion with your bank about this because there are cash flow implications and there are other risks going on on the farm, weather, feed, staffing, buying other stuff to do, you know, anything, fuel prices, other stuff. So you really need to understand all about your business if you're going to bring hedging milk futures uh, into, that, into that envelope. One of the other th risks of hedging with futures is that if you go lock in the price, so if you go and lock in, let's say $5, $5.50, You've locked it in. If the price of milk continues to rise, you've theoretically foregone the opportunity of a higher price. Now I'm gonna to touch a little bit on options um, if we get some time at the end because that's a way that you can lock in price and still get the upside if the milk price goes higher, but we're not trading options at the moment. And, and grab my card and grab my details at the end of the presentation and give me your email and we can talk about that later on, right? But know this that doing nothing is doing something, right? So if you don't hedge, you're making a conscious decision to do something, all right? So there's no such thing about doing nothing. So hedging is about managing price risk and locking in a margin. Hedging is not about making money. If you were to go and look at all the big companies around the world that trade all sorts of different things, interest rates, commodities, foreign exchange, and they have hedging policies, you walk into Fonterra's you know, FX Treasury Room, you walk into the Bank of New Zealand, or you walk into other companies, they have hedging policies. Those hedging policies are mechanical. They are not view-based. They don't sit there and go, we think we'll sell some futures today. They don't do that. They work out what their, where their break-even is, and when the market moves above their break-even price, and they can use futures and they have a hedging policy to do so, they do it mechanically. They don't take a view. All right, that's very important. But that's nothing to stop having an element of a view in your hedging and how you want to do it. But this is all about trying to get educated about this and happy to talk further about that. But just understand that if we're going to look to use milk futures as a dairy farmer to lock in a price and make money, it's about locking in a margin, okay? So let's have a look at an example. So just before we do that, so what drives the milk price? So I would stand up here and say that Fonterra does not drive the milk price. But up until recently, the only place that most people could go or listen to or understand was what Fonterra told you about the milk price, right? But that's gonna change, right? Because over the next few years, this milk price future will tell you every day where the price of milk's gonna go. It may not be right, but it will tell you in a snapshot of time exactly where it is right now. Now you may or may not know, but on the AgriHQ website, there is a calculator that, um, that shows the price. That's that there. Now this was done before last night's GDT, but in here, and you can get access to this. If you don't have access to it, ask the guys here because they can give you access to it. It's a really, really, really good calculator and, and 
shows exactly where the price of milk right now should be based on all the variables. And all the variables, as you may or may not know, they go into milk are whole milk powder, skim, fat, butter, buttermilk powder, the exchange rate, which is always the hard one. There's obviously a lactose cost and cash and capital cost. So if, if, if a snapshot in time right now is it saying that the farm gate milk price is around 421. Now, one thing, we know what the price of whole milk powder and all these things are. What we don't really know for certain is what Fonterra or, or any producer's hedging policy is for foreign exchange. You've got to make a little bit of a guess for that, okay? So, but that's where it's saying at the moment. Now, GDT was flat last night and the price went down a little bit. So this has actually dropped a little bit further. So it is down a little bit. But that, that pretty much tells you where it is. And you may not be able to see that that clearly, but that's a snapshot of the current market just taken off my pricing screen. So that one at the top line in September 16, there's no price there because that season's done this year, right? September 17, there's a buy there at $4.45 per kilo of milk solid, and there's a seller at $4.60. That's just the milk price, no dividend or anything like that, okay? So that's what that futures market is predicting for this season, but it's actually above that. That's interesting, right? Next season, September 18, you probably can't see that, but that bid there's $5.30. So someone's prepared to pay $5.30 for September 18. So that's next season after this season. And the seller is $5.60. And it actually traded at $5.60. This market's brand new. It's got a wee way to go. This is going to be a good contract when it gets going. I've been trading futures for 30 years. It's got all the makings of a good futures contract. 560 for September 18 season. So how many, somebody raise your hands, how many people would be happy to lock in $5.60 right now? Okay, a few. Who, who would like a lot more? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. But again, that's what's driving it. So as this milk futures develops and trades every day, you're gonna know where the price, you don't have to wait for Fonterra to make an announcement every three or four months. You can go and look at this, you can go and look at this, get our market report, other people's market reports tell you exactly where the price is. Okay, so let's assume a hedge. Let's have a look at a hedge. So let's look at this. So assume you hedge 60,000 kilos of milk solids. Now we know it's 6,000 kilos of contracts, so that's 10 contracts. That's equating to 18,000 initial margin, because that's 10 lots times 1,800. A futures contract is also known as a lot. That's just what they're called. So that's 10 lots. So you have to put up $18,000 of initial margin if you want to hedge 60,000 kilos of milk solids, okay? So who holds that 18,000? The exchange, the clearinghouse. That's put to your broker and the clearinghouse holds that. And in fact, here's what's interesting. When you go into the futures market and you buy or sell a futures contract, and I might buy or sell off another member, there's a process called Novation. At exactly that I trade that contract, up pops the clearinghouse, and they take the other side of every contract. So your counterparty is the clearinghouse, and the clearinghouse manage the cash of the market. So that's their job, all right? So you don't worry about who's on the other side of your contract, know this. As long as you follow the rules by cash, you pay your margin calls, a futures exchange has never collapsed. All right, it's run by cash, okay? But that's who's on the other side of your futures contract, the clearinghouse. In this, in this case, it's the NZX clearing. That's who's on the other side, not us. We just transact the, uh, the, the contract. We're a member of the exchange. So is that just on that? Is there uh, security around that? Well, the, the security for a contract is the initial margin. Right, so that's what people put up first. So you're putting up a se about around a 7.5% deposit. That's the security, that's cash. That sits with the clearinghouse. That's their job to manage all that. And, and I'll show you in the next example how that will change and how further cash is called for. Is, how, how safe is that? Well, I would say, uh, well, I would say this. Safe as a house? Safe as safe, maybe not an Auckland house, right? But, <laughs> but very safe because it sits with the stock exchange, with the clearinghouse, and no futures exchange has ever collapsed. 
right? So it's very, I would say it's very safe. Where we've seen banks collapse, right? No clearinghouse has, no exchange has. So it's very safe. It sits with the stock exchange. Very reputable people. Not just because I'm standing in their tent do I say that, but they are. But it's, it's hey, we can have, the, have this discussion offline if you like. That's not a concern in my view, all right? Okay, so obviously, you know, there's a, a 50 cent move against you. If a minimum price is one cent, well, that's $600 on 10 contracts. 6,000 kilos times one cent times 10 locks. So a 50 cent move against you. So if you locked in five bucks or 550, and it went to six bucks, so it went 50 cents against you, then you'd have to stump up another $30,000 of variation margin or margin call over that time. When, when you say it, go, it went to six bucks, what do you measure that against? The market moving every day. So what, what's your benchmark? Is it really... It's the futures market itself. So if you were trading the September 17 contract and you dealt at 550, that contract closed at $6, there would be a settlement price, and then you'd be on a margin call of 50 cents, all right? This, then, the, this is not rocket science, right? There's a few moving parts here, though, right? So this, you know, so if you don't quite get everything I'm sort of getting, that's fine. You know, there's no exam at the end of this to get out of the tent. But there are a few moving parts, and happy to point you in the same direction on this, but Wikipedia and Google and all that will explain all this stuff and a simple spreadsheet and a few emails with us will clear the fog on all of this. But I'll go to the next slide and that probably give you a little bit of an idea. So let's look at a hedge running the numbers, okay? So we're looking at hedging 60,000 kilos of milk solids using the previous example. So we decided to lock in price at $5.50 a kilo. Okay, so we put up our 18,000, our initial margin, our IM. Everyone get that? 1,800 times 10 contracts, 18,000. The price then went to $6.50. Yeehaw. Not so good necessarily because you've locked in 550, but understand this. If you made a decision to lock in 550, you were happy to do that at that time. Just because it did this, shouldn't really be a concern. Yeah, it might be slightly annoying, but that's not what hedging is about, right? But this is what you need to know, that if the market moved up to there, your initial margin is still 18,000, but you now have a variation margin or a margin call of 60,000. So how much cash have you tied up there? 78,000, right? Then the market moves back down to sort of 575. Your initial margin always must be maintained if, you, if you're holding that hedge and your variation margin down only 15k. How much cash are you tying up there? 33. Moves up to there a little bit, 48. Then it closes down there at $4.50 and you've locked in $5.50. So your eight, so the contract's now expiring. See how you took it in June of say this year and September next year the market Expired, Fonterra came out with their final price, $4.50. Your 18,000 is returned to you, because that's just a good faith deposit, and you've made 60,000 on your hedge, right? What have you sold your milk at the gate at? Theoretically, 450, right? Because you're selling milk every day at the gate, and I know you don't get your 450 all at once, it gets paid over a certain period of time, but that's how it comes out in the wash. Yeah, but because you hedged at 550, that's what you made. 550. So your hedge profit was sixty thousand dollars. The important thing is that your maximum cash flow requirement throughout that whole exercise was seventy-eight thousand. Now this is just a scenario, right? That's you know, yeah, that could be a, that's a prediction. It's not really. In fact, there's no. This is not what we're going to say is going to happen. Every, every so often we have to uh, pay that difference and it's been settled back to us every so often during the year as well. Yeah, so every day that position is marked to market. So every day you'd be getting a margin call and then at this point this is how much margin you'd have locked up. So it happens every day, all right? That's why it's really important that if you're thinking about hedging using milk futures, you need to have access to cash. 
Now, who theoretically has got the, most of the cash? The bank, right? Would, do you think a bank would support you doing this? Yes, they would. Yes, they should. Are they going to come knocking on your door and want to do it? No. One of the reasons why they won't is they're very nervous banks because of the interest rate swap debacle that went down a few years ago. And now it's much more, there's much more compliance in the world. So banks are a bit nervous, naturally so, not just to do with interest rate swaps, but they're nervous about coming to you people and saying, perhaps you should look at doing a hedge. And you do this, and it goes to there, and you complain, and you're on the front page of the paper saying, they told me to hedge and I've lost a dollar, right? You need to own this. You need to own this. You need to go and talk to your bank. You can come and talk to us, and we'll go and talk to your bank with you. You need to be talking to your bank or the person that can supply this money to run this exercise. Because the biggest issue you're going to have is this, cash flow implication. And the bank should, if you're a well-run dairy farm that knows what they're doing, understands their costs, they'll see that. They'll be happy to lend you, they should be happy to lend you the money. Why? Because they make money on it. Exactly. Keeps you successful. They make a bit of money on it. You could lock in, you know, if this price was not 550, let's say we're up at 650 or 7, how many people in this room would be happy to lock in 650 or 7 bucks a kilo of milk solid? Right? Still a lot of people not happy with 6 or 7. 8? 9? 9 anyone? 10? Do I have a 10 in the room? Okay, but the point is, there will come a point where you'll look at the price of milk that you're getting at the gate and you'll say you've added up your interest, your cost of running the farm, your wages, your tractors, your diesel, your fuel, your extra you know, feed that you've got in, you'll add all that up and you'll go, you know what? Six bucks or five fifty, six bucks. I'm pretty happy with that price actually. Now there is an instrument that you can use to lock it in. But here's what you need to understand. You need to understand how this works. You need to understand the cash flow implication that it can mean to you because there are risks in doing this. You do not want to go into this position and be unable to support it, i.e., if you couldn't support $78,000 or more in this example, you shouldn't be doing it, okay? But there are, banks should help you do this, and they, they will. They won't necessarily come knocking on your door to do it, but you can go knocking on theirs. Assuming you can get a lot of credit from the bank where you've got, you know, bank support. So how automated is that daily settlement? Is it quite admin heavy on a daily basis, or can it just be automated for the time of the contract? Yeah, so let's say, for example, you do get a facility with your bank to support this, and you would make, and they may give you control over that facility, right? So that's used for your hedging. We ring you up and say, hey, you're in a $20,000 margin call. You, put, you go straight in and transfer that money straight across through online banking, internet banking. So it needs to be able to come across in a day. What would we say to people if the minimum requirement is 18000 we'd recommend that people have a buffer of money in there so you don't get into a small margin call, right? But make sure you have enough cash or access to cash to support the position. There's risks in having to do that, but you should be fine. Banks should be able to help you out on that. So how do you trade? Through your uh, friendly futures broker there. You can actually also trade online. Um, just a couple of things, who are we? We're a futures broker, we're members of the NZX, we've, we're locally owned and operated. Um, you know, we're very active in this market, we produce reports. Um, we've got a few dairy, dairy farmers in the room, come from dairy farms, so we understand how the market works. So our job is to basically educate, we can give you ideas, we can teach you about how to use the market properly. The number one thing we really do is educate. How do we get paid? Because when you take a contract, we charge you a brokerage. It's not much, it's like, it's around half a cent on a kilo of milk solid. So it's pretty small from a brokerage perspective, but we can give you ideas and give you access and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, so just to summarize, so now, with, there's no GMP, but right now there are tools for you to manage the milk price risk. And that's what this presentation was about. I'm gonna feel free to catch up, grab my card, or ask me any other questions later. We're not talking about speculating here, we're talking about hedging. We're talking about managing price risk. This is what it is. There's now a tool to do that. There are 
A things to learn. It's not very well spell checked, are there? There are A, uh, A things to learn and understand. That won't be in the next presentation, but there are things here to learn and understand, so you need to do that, right? And there are cash flow implications. Oh, I think I've stressed that hard enough, right? Go and talk to your bank. Get your bank to talk to us. Most of the rural bankers know us. They get our dairy reports, they speak to us, they understand this, we've gone and spoken to them about this. Um, and as I say, we're happy to get involved in those conversations. And then get hold of us if you want to have some more questions and, and want to know more. Thank you so much for your attention. I've really enjoyed presenting this. Um, enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks very much. Any questions, fire away.